Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Let's do it. Let's do it. Welcome to Dangerous Ideas. I'm Lee Camp. This was the scene in the town where I live, Baltimore, Maryland, this morning, middle of the night, 1 or 2 a.m. This was what went down because the U.S. empire is collapsing, apparently, uh, both hypothetically and in very real ways. Uh, this is the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And uh, it did not go well for the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, and as of now, there's no evidence that this is linked to the, uh, to the collapsing of the U.S. empire, the collapsing of our infrastructure, the collapsing of our way of life. However... Generally, when these things go down, you find out a little later that, oh, I don't know. the. So apparently the, the ship lost power, ran into one of the pillars, knocked the bridge down. And, and this is a massive bridge, massive. Uh, and But why did the ship lose power? Well, it won't surprise me at all if we find out that the ship hadn't been like checked by regulators in the past, oh, I don't know, 140 years or something. Uh, so that type of thing tends to be revealed later after these moments of, uh, of catastrophe like this. But yes, this is my, uh, my hometown nowadays, Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, the massive collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Anyway, just thought I'd bring that as a, a, little, a little teaser here of what we're seeing in this world, big news day. And I'm going to be getting into... So much of what's happened today with uh, Israel, Israel's special genocide operation continues as well as Julian Assange and so much more news. Please click thumbs up, click share, click all those good things, subscribe, and let's do it. Uh, I am joined right now by a hero of mine and also a Pulitzer Prize winner, a best-selling author, a professor, an activist, and uh, an icon. Please welcome Chris Hedges. Hello. Thanks, Lee. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, how are you? Glad to see you weren't on the bridge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole kind of, it's kind of emblematic of, uh, although, I mean, it was a, it, the bridge didn't crumble because it was decayed, but it's emblematic of uh, just the widespread uh, decrepitude that is gripping the entire country physically, the physical infrastructure of the country. Yeah, I think it's a, a good analogy, whether it's due to, I mean, you know, you often find out later that it was due to the company trying to cut you know, cut corners and well, make money course. over, over human course. life. Yeah. Well, they lost control of the ship, didn't they? Yeah, it seems that they lost power uh, shortly there before uh, it went into the pillar, but I don't know why, but yeah. Um, but let's get to, you know, I, this, I hadn't planned to make this the topic, but uh, we just got a ruling today on Julian Assange. Uh, you have fought very hard to try and stop this slow motion crucifixion of, uh, of a hero and, and one of the best journalists and publishers this world has ever seen. And the U.S. empire has been torturing him for a decade, over a decade now. Um, this ruling, it, it does mean he's not going to be shipped to the United States tonight, but it is not uh, necessarily much to celebrate other than that. It, it basically is asking the U.S. for more assurances that the U.S. isn't going to harm him. Right. So I was in the courtroom in London for those two days and followed it. And whether it was due to negligence or whether it was intentional and the judges kept questioning the prosecution about these two issues. First Amendment, will he be guaranteed First Amendment protection? And can you guarantee that he will not be subject to capital punishment? And the lawyer, lawyers ref, did not give those assurances. So I think we all left the court assuming that he would be allowed to appeal on some of the counts. Now, uh, when his extradition was blocked in the lower court by Vanessa Baretzer. She did so uh, because of the prison conditions that he would endure in the United States and labeled him as a suicide risk. 
then we saw the United States appeal. And it gave a diplomatic note, which has no legal validity. It did this, it, it, but it, it, they gave the note to the court and said, uh, he won't be held in Florence, Colorado. No, nobody's held in Florence, Colorado pre-trial. Uh, he won't be subject to SAMs. These are special administrative measures, which are very punitive and almost complete isolation. Um, and he won't be held in solitary confinement unless he violates uh, regulations within, he would be in the Alexandria jail, unless he violates regulations, then he would be subject to these things. And the uh, court accepted this. Um, uh, and then we saw an appeal of that high court decision. That's what has happened now. Uh, so the, I think a lot of us feel that if the Biden administration, uh, even something as tepid as a diplomatic note, is able to assure the court that he will not be, he's not a U.S. citizen, so there's some question about First Amendment rights, uh, but that he would not be denied First Amendment rights and he would not be executed, that might be enough. Uh, but I think really what's happened is the Biden administration, which has a lot of problems, uh, doesn't really want this on top of it, uh, and they'll deal with it after the election. Yeah, and some people are pointing to the fact that Obama was in Britain a few days ago meeting with the uh the prime minister, and some people think he might have been the one uh, saying, can you hold him until past the election? Uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, I didn't put much credence in this because it came from the Wall Street Journal, but now it seems that Consortium News has their own sources that have verified that uh, the Justice Department is in talks for a plea deal that would make it a misdemeanor and Assange would walk free if he were to take it, but. I have to be a little careful. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there, it's that is not an inaccurate report. Uh, you know, apparently they're stuck on one issue. I don't know what it is, but that there is dialogue. Yes, there is. Well, that would be good. Certainly good to hear. Um, okay, I want to. I want to move though to uh, you know the 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 most pressing I issue in terms of global politics, and that is Israel's ongoing uh, genocide. Um, we did see this UN resolution where the U.S. finally uh, abstained, uh, and after 177 days of, of genocide, uh, to allow this resolution to go through, but the resolution seems to have uh, little impact, at least Israel claiming it has little impact. Well, Israel doesn't abide by UN resolutions. That's been true for 75 years. The Biden administration has gone out of their way to characterize this as non-binding, which means that it will have no effect. Um, the The United States is clearly they know they know what's coming. They know what's coming in Rafa, a bloodbath. They know that mass starvation is imminent, already uh, pronounced in the north, where the Israelis have blocked any aid deliveries. About three hundred thousand people are still in northern Gaza. And they want to create distance from themselves and the nightmare, I mean, the, the, the nightmare that we're seeing, which is about to get worse. Uh, but the, it's rhetorical. They have cut uh, un, uh, funding for UNRWA, which is the main source of aid and food for most Gazans. And uh, they continue massive weapon shipments, even weapon shipments that uh, uh, are not approved by Congress. So. Uh, that's what they're doing. It's optics, and they they know how bad they know as bad as it is. And it's, I mean, uh, you know, I, I was in Sarajevo during the war, so that was three to four hundred shells a day, which had about four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day. You juxtapose that with Gaza, you're talking about hundreds, hundreds of deaths a day. So it just shows you the. Uh, level of saturation bombing, and sorry if it was no fun. I mean, I still have nightmares about it, uh, but it's nothing compared to Gaza. So they know what's coming, and I think that this was a way for them to uh, try and create some distance between them and Israel, because as as ugly and horrific as it is, it's really a, about to get almost uh, unfathomable in terms of the extent of the human suffering. I mean, you have an orchestrated famine and six kilometers away over the border from Rafa are literally thousands of aid trucks. I mean, it is just uh, 
uh, you know, for those of us who follow it in detail, unconscionable. And uh, and yet the United States has no intention of halting it. We, and they could because 68, roughly 68 percent of the munitions that Israel needs to continue this genocide come from the U.S. So with a flick of a switch, they could stop it. Yeah. And I think the calculation is that the shipments are going roughly every 36 hours. Uh, oh, from the United States. So, yeah, they, it's not just the U.S., the U.K. and other countries are doing it, but in Germany, of course, but we're the major arms supplier. And they've, there's just a air bridge now out of Cyprus where they're just nonstop flying this stuff in. As you mentioned, you've seen war. Uh, I am happy to say I never have. Um, but this is not war. This is, can you talk about the difference? Because, you know, the the mortality rate of children in modern warfare is like four to 6%. And in Gaza, it's like 45%. Right, well, it's not war because Hamas doesn't have, they don't have any mechanized units. They don't have any artillery. They don't have an air force. They don't have a Navy. They don't have any, they have crude rockets, but they don't have any missiles. They don't have tanks. They don't, they don't have anything. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, and, and Hamas is largely in the tunnels. So the, the it's it, it is clearly designed to eradicate uh, the Palestinians from Gaza to make it uninhabitable. That's why all the medical centers, clinics, hospitals have been destroyed. I mean, it, in, Israel has been individually targeting wells. Uh, the, the, you, the, the point is to uh, make it uh, a, a place where that cannot in any way sustain life as they orchestrate a famine. And then, of course, infectious diseases as well. There's no clean water. Uh, the, 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 con the water is contaminated. So um, it, it's really, I mean, I covered the uh, famine in the southern Sudan in the late 80s, which was pretty awful. But, but Israel wins the prize on this one. It is really disgusting. Um, so no, it's, it's clearly a war against the Palestinian people. It clearly is, meets all the criteria of genocide. Um, uh, they're bringing down, it's why, you know, the families, when, when you hear about the deaths of families, it's like a hundred family members. It's because in Gaza, families live grouped together. I mean, it's one of the most densely populated places on the planet. So if a son or a daughter gets married, they actually just add a, another uh, story to their building or they're all living on the same street. So uh, when Israel obliterates that street or, or, or bombs that building, then you have generations of a family completely wiped out at once. That, that's happening repeatedly. Um, and then the targeting of journalists, uh, the targeting of academics, uh, writers, poets, doctors, university. I think there's a hundred academics that have been killed. I mean, it, it's it, it is a way to and that and and the bombing of museums, the bombing of cultural centers, the destruction of Gaza's main library. That's an impart, important component of any genocidal project because what you're doing is is eradicating an identity. You're eradicating cultural expression, and of course, quite. Uh, in terms of the targeting of journalists, you're eradicating the ability uh, to even report on what's happening to you. So uh, th th these are all systematic uh, and have been from the beginning. And the idea that this is, I mean, Hamas, well, first of all, Hamas exists outside of Gaza. Um, even the United States in intelligence reports that have been printed in the New York Times said that Hamas is far from destroyed. Uh, I mean, I was surprised to say that they have at least another two months of uh, fighting capability. Uh, I mean, given the fact that, that it's very difficult to get for them to get munitions uh, and they're, of course, relying on their stockpiles. I mean, even that surprised me. So, no, this is a war against the Palestinian people. That's the intent. Uh, and, and that's why South Africa brought the case uh, courageously and correctly to the International Court of Justice. Talk a little about uh, this. You, you wrote a column about him, I, I, about it. I've talked about it as well. This uh, pier that's being built that is, you know, the Biden administration and I Israel, I guess, as well, are acting like this is how we're going to help the Gazan people. And it is so clearly, if you wanted aid to go to Gaza, you would open the gates right. for the aid to get to Gaza. The pier yeah. is... Uh, well, they've, they've already announced that Israel will be in charge of the security and the distribution of the food. 
which tells you everything, i.e. no food will get to the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, I mean, when you build a pier, things come in and things go out. And the, the intent, and I don't know whether they will succeed, but the, the clear intent on the part of the Netanyahu government is to ethnically cleanse Gaza. So when Blinken was traveling around the Middle East on his first trip, he actually went to Cairo, uh, went to Jordan and he, with quotas. He wanted 1.1 million Palestinians on the Sinai, 700,000 in Iraq, and all of the Arab leaders said no. That's the intent. And, and the Americans know that that is the intent. Uh, so f floated as an idea very early on, actually, in the conflict were ships, because in 1982, uh, the Israelis orchestrated uh, the evacuation of the PLO and Yasser Arafat out of Beirut on ships. So, I don't know, six and a half thousand or something went to Tunis, and then another couple thousand went to other parts of the Arab world. There, they've, there have been reports in Aritz and the Israeli press about negotiations with countries in Africa, countries in Latin America, that for uh, remuneration would be willing to accept Palestinians, whether that will come to fruition, I don't know. Of course, no one knows. Even the Israelis don't know. Uh, but that's the intent. And the peer, uh, if they can't get them into the Sinai, uh, and the Egyptian government, for many reasons, does not want them in the Sinai, um, you know, they'll try every avenue that they have. Uh, but the idea that the peer is about delivering humanitarian assistance is ludicrous. Uh, there, there are no trucks, there are no drivers, there's no infrastructure, even if there was the intent to deliver humanitarian assistance. They don't exist anymore. Yeah, and I mean, it it, it wouldn't even be built for a month or two months. Or, right. it's, so, yeah. it's so meaningless when you have a thousand, like you mentioned, a thousand trucks waiting at the border uh, to go in. And apparently the United States has said that they believe Israel is not stopping aid from getting in when We've seen video of the Israeli military putting these protesters in the zone between the trucks and the gates. Like, it's very clear Israel. Well, and the few aid that gets in, they fire on the, like yeah. the flower massacre. But that's not the only incident. There's been a couple dozen. They fire on people attempting to get aid. They fired and killed uh, uh, Palestinian police that have sought to protect the trucks. They, no, I mean, the, first of all, the, Aid shipments are down for last month by 44%. So they've almost cut, almost cut by half. And they're not that the aid is in any way sufficient. It's largely symbolic, but they've even cut that. Uh, no, no. The intent is clearly starvation. The intent is to uh, force the Palestinians to choose between death and leaving. That's it. Do you feel like we're... It feels a bit like a hinge in history. It feels like this is a pivotal moment for the U.S. empire, and I include Israel in that. Uh, as your friend and mine, Cornell West, said, this is uh, the, the veil has come off in this moment. We are seeing the genocidal nature of, of both Israel and the U.S. right now. Well, yeah, in particular, the global south. And in the global south, they've suffered from settler colonial projects and U.S. imperialism. Uh, I think it's not accidental that the one country that is attempting to block the genocide in a serious way, Yemen, uh, has suffered catastrophic starvation, cholera epidemics, a siege, a blockade. So they, what was done to them is now being done to the Palestinians. You have millions of Yemenis marching through the streets, and the Houthis have uh, done a pretty good job of shutting down a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the merchant uh, traffic uh, into Israel, and then they've had to open up a land corridor with the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan so that Israel can get supplied. Um, and that, of course, gets into the hypocrisy of the Arab regimes, which are uh, not only not doing anything to halt the genocide, uh, but actually quietly aiding and abetting it, in particular in Egypt. Um, and Sisi loathes Hamas because it's an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he has long worked with Israeli intelligence and the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, you've had these, this kind of theater, it was almost gruesome theater of airdrops. And, um, but that, that's a, an attempt to appease the Arab street. I mean, demonstrations in Jordan 
they tried to storm the embassy yesterday. I mean, and about 60% of Jordan is of Palestinian descent. So uh, this is uh, putting a lot of pressure on the regimes themselves. Uh, uh, CC runs a pretty brutal dictatorship, but you have had protests, especially outside the Egyptian press syndicate. I was invited by the Egyptian press syndicate. We were all going to go to Rafa to protest the fact that Israel has locked out foreign reporters and call for a ceasefire, and the CC government never allowed us to even get up to Rafa. So um, it, it, it's putting great strains on these Arab dictatorships uh, that are uh, compliant uh, and uh, collude uh, with Israel to sustain this genocide. Uh, last question, because I want to value your time. Um, do you see anything changing this at this point? It just seems like nothing can stop it. It's just endless. No, I, I'm very pessimistic because the only way to stop it is to cut the arms supplies. That would stop it. Israel would not be able to continue. And I don't think Biden is uh, has any kind of moral core. They're not going to pay that political price. Um, they will carry out public relations efforts like uh, abstaining on the ceasefire resolution or in their rhetoric has changed, remember, uh, but substantially nothing will change. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I, I don't I don't know what it's going to look like when it finishes. I, I know what Israel wants. And the United Washington is very clear about what Israel wants. And uh, what is sure is that within, I mean, the UN is talking about a full-scale famine within uh, a few weeks. Yeah. That is coming, clearly, um, and it will be a humanitarian crisis, a catastrophic humanitarian crisis, and Israel hopes to use that as a lever to get the Palestinians out. Um, how it plays out, what happens, I don't know. Um, but yeah, you're right about the peer. It has, it has nothing to do with aid, nothing to do with aid. Thank you so much for taking the time to, yep. to join me here and, uh, you know, keep up all the great work. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate it. That was the always amazing Chris Hedges. Thank you so much for everybody who's joining now. Uh, you guys rock. Thank you, Nadia, for the donation. CBS 2021 said 66,000. Yeah, I remember that number. I think I think we're down in the upper 50,000s of structurally deficient bridges bridges in the United States. So, you know, upper 50,000s, that's not bad. Uh, Nadia continues, this empire is collapsing more literally and catastrophically than the Brits' Crystal Palace in 1936. I will say that the Baltimore Bridge that collapsed uh, today, it, it, it not, not it, it, something hit it. So now, wh whether it would have collapsed if it had been a stronger, better, not structurally deficient bridge, deficient bridge that's quite possible. Uh, we also got a donation over on Rumble. Uh, Cadro Rodriguez, don't know how to pronounce that name. Can I get a damn straight? J damn straight C's, is that what it is? Damn straight C's, yeah. Uh, appreciate you and thank you for the solidarity and for helping support this show. By the way, even if you're not watching this live, you can still do uh, what are called thanks or super chats or live, but... Either way, even if it's not, even if you're not watching live, you can click the thanks button, throw a couple of dollars to support the show. Can't do it without you. I have a huge show still coming, even though we're already past the awesome Chris Hedges interview. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. And if you would like to, to, to hear more, this actually fits with both Assange and Israel, this uh, article I want to bring you. The the, uh, the United States is supposed to give assurances, right, that they will not harm Assange any more than locking him up for the rest of his life. Uh, that's the latest thing that's just, you know, come down. They need the, the British government needs more assurances that the U.S. empire is not going to do anything beyond just torturing Julian Assange. You know, we, we're going to keep him in solitary confinement and make him miserable and try and kill him that way. But we're not going to execute him. So they need more assurances like that. But. The U.S. assertions mean are meaningless about anything. And here's another one. The U.S. has announced that Israel is using weapons in line with international law and that uh, they are not blocking Gaza aid. 
And of course, both of those things are provably false. And the reason the United States is saying this is because it actually breaks U.S. law to send arms to a country that is stopping U.S. aid from getting into said country. So it actually breaks our own laws. Then it also breaks international laws, simply all the war crimes Israel is committing, as well as, you know, visually, you don't even have to take someone's word for it. Visually, you can look and see that Israel has dropped white phosphorus, which is illegal under the international law. And I believe someone also pointed out that that white phosphorus was likely made by American weapons contractors. Oh, I think there was actually a photo. I may have shown it on the live stream of some of the white phosphorus canisters that they were getting prepping to use. And they were made by U.S. companies. So, you know, the reason the U.S. has decided, as we're seeing from this article, that it is that Israel is acting according to international law and is not blocking Gaza aid is because the U.S. does not abide by international law either. So why would they care whether Israel is abiding by international law? Um, and I want to bring you this clip of the State uh, State Department spokesperson, person. That's all, folks. Uh, a spokesperson answering the question about whether Israel will abide by the UN resolution. And he says no. And uh, interesting little exchange here. Please hold. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Negotiations to try to achieve what this resolution calls for, mm -hmm. which is the um, uh, an immediate ceasefire and the release of hostages. I don't know. I can't say that this impact, this resolution is going to have any impact on those negotiations. So, but those negotiations are ongoing. They've been ongoing over the weekend, and they've made progress. Right. So I, I don't expect you to answer this now, but maybe just stick this in your pocket. If that's the case, what the hell is the point of the UN or the UN Security Council? So we think it plays an important role. Um, it it does, range, even though its action does. Absolutely. Isn't that the key question? If you don't expect Israel to abide by this at all, if the U.S. is not going to stop shipping weapons in order to abide by this, if other countries are not going to stop shipping weapons to facilitate this genocide, then what does the U.N. resolution even mean? It, 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 does the U.N. mean anything? It doesn't do anything. And this clown, this puppet, this uh, marionette stooge at the State Department is like, we think the UN is, is very important to ignore. It's a, it's a very important thing for us to ignore when they try and stop genocide. Absolutely nothing. I mean, every, and, and that you're going to get what you would like to see, not out of the UN, but out of discussions in Doha. So we believe it's important that the UN speak uh, and the UN Security Council speak on matters of uh, international security. It's why we've been engaged in this process. Why we, th we think it's important they speak so we can ignore them. Thought we were gonna have a successful vote on Friday that Russia and China uh, unfortunately and quite cynically vetoed, but. That line also is hilarious. The reason Russia and China who have been pushing for ceasefires uh, for the past several months, the reason they vetoed the U.S. drafted so-called ceasefire resolution on last Friday was because it allowed Israel to attack. Uh, it allowed Israel to attack. Um, someone's saying they can't hear it. It allowed Israel to attack Rafa. Uh, so it's. It's basically allowing the genocide to continue, but calling it a ceasefire. It was utter, utter bullshit, and the uh, utter utter bullshit. And anyway, that's our that's our clowns over at the State Department. Thank goodness we have them, and thank goodness they tell us that the point of the UN is to ignore it, is to ignore what the UN says. Meanwhile, other uh, other people at our government, such as Jake Sullivan. What is his position again? Something national security. Anyway, he uh, proudly stated. He proudly stated that he was so excited to welcome Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant to the White House today. We had a constructive. This is uh, yesterday. Constructive conversation about how to ensure best ensure Hamas's lasting defeat in Gaza. So that's what he said about this lovely gentleman. You can see, uh, I think he's speaking Hebrew, but you can see what he's saying. Uh, everything he just said is a war crime. 
You are. It is not legal under international law to cut off the food, water, power to a group of people because it is illegal under international law to have collective punishment, to punish children who have nothing to do with what you're angry about, okay? They have nothing to do with the war, to punish people that are not involved in Hamas, that are not Hamas militants. That is illegal under international law. So here is Israel again fully confessing to the goals of war crimes. War crimes are their goals. Atrocities are their goals. Genocide is their goal. It, here it is, defense minister on camera saying these things. Also, we are. he then says we are fighting human animals, which, of course, genocide will speak. If you want people to be okay with genocide, to be okay with murdering innocent people, you have to get them to dehumanize those people, to act like they are not humans, to act like they are animals or they are insects. And here he is outwardly saying we are fighting human animals. So anyway, when people ask about intent, I played the clip yesterday of uh, corporate media uh, flaccid uh, package of decaying raccoons, uh, Jake Tapper, um, that's actually his full name. He tried to push back against AOC, who did call it a genocide, to her credit, uh, by saying, well, genocide requires intent. Uh, you sure Israel has intent? Well, we have video of their intent. We have video of people like Yoav Gallant, like Netanyahu, calling these people human animals, saying they want to cut off the food, water, and electricity, and everything else to these people, which is genocidal intent. They say it publicly. It's not even a secret. It's not even a secret. Okay? Like, keep it a secret. If you want to commit genocide and not have everyone know, then you should totally keep it a secret. That's something you should absolutely do. Okay, I have more information on USAID's efforts to shut down all news sites or at least heavily stop the traffic to any news sites that do not further the U.S. empire's propaganda. I'm going to bring you that as well as much more. And later in the episode, I will destroy Tucker Carlson uh, on, a certain, on, a, on a certain issue. I know that you guys like or some of you like that Tucker is right on some things. He is right on some things. He does. He, he's good on the proxy war in Ukraine. So uh, I'm not uh, saying everything he's ever said is wrong. But on many things, he says he's wrong. He very much wants war with China. He he basically comes at things as to how can I make the U.S. empire better, uh, stronger, larger. And his view is that the proxy war in Ukraine is not helping, which, OK, that's I'm glad he's against the proxy war in Ukraine. But that does not mean he's uh, one of the good guys. Anyway, in, in, a, in a bit, I will be playing that uh, short clip destroying Tucker Carlson. By the way, I wanted to bring you a little update on something I brought you yesterday about uh, the U.S. connection, we'll call it, to the attack in Moscow. Uh, I have posted the video clip of that at youtube.com slash moment of clarity, as well as rumble.com slash Lee Camp. You can watch the clip of just that segment. But something uh, I, I noticed as I was putting up the video, I noticed that the Wikipedia page of the uh, one of the founders or no, one of the heads of ISIS K, right? They say ISIS K is to blame for the Moscow attack that's killed 137 people. Um, the in his Wikipedia page, which I brought you yesterday, it says that he was security, a security contractor in a regular at Bagram Air Base, a U.S. air base in Afghanistan at the time. And he also would ran security for one of the CIA's right hand men in Afghanistan at the time. And I brought that to you, and it's on his Wikipedia page. And as I'm putting up the video, I realized the Wikipedia page had been altered, and that had been removed from the Wikipedia page, the stuff about Bagram Air Base, et cetera. So I mentioned that in the video, which you can watch at my YouTube. But now I've checked it uh, just a little while ago, and it's been added back in to the Wikipedia page. So when you actually go to his Wikipedia page, you will not see that it's been removed because they've added it back in. Now, that type of thing can happen for multiple reasons. One thing is that the CIA is regularly, or U.S. government, is regularly editing Wikipedia pages. And they you can see this because edits are often made public, and you can see on them that these edits came from U.S. government offices. But 
There is a tiny cabal of Wikipedia editors that really run things. It's about 500 people, but like 95% of all edits are actually made by just like, you know, 20 people. And anyway, uh, it's quite possible that a government agency withdrew that sentence from his Wikipedia and then a Wikipedia editor somewhere else put it back in saying it was illegitimately removed. And that can be the reason for it disappearing and coming back. Anyway, I just wanted to give you that little uh, update. Thank you, Dan, so much for the donation. Dan says, thank you, Lee, for guiding me through all the U.S. psyops and propaganda garbage. Well, thank you for the solidarity, for being part of the show, for helping this show continue despite all of the suppression. And suppression and censorship is one of the things I'll be talking about right now. By the way, everybody, remember, remember to do all the, even if you can't do it with the Super Chats or the Thanks button, Remember to do all the free stuff you can to help the show. Click the thumbs up, click subscribe, click the bell icon, even if you've already subscribed so you get the notifications some of the time. And then most importantly, just show up. Show up to our live streams Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, but you can also watch it at any time. This is coming from Mint Press, one of my favorite people, Alan McLeod. I've had him on the show uh, multiple times. He wrote an article about how USAID, which is uh, one of these, you know, CIA cutouts, it's a U.S. quote unquote aid agency headed by Samantha Power. And uh, and they they yeah, sometimes they will send aid somewhere, but it's almost exclusively to help further U.S. imperial aims uh, to create revolutions, to create coups, to bring down democratically elected leaders. That's what USAID is. Anyway, he says a report from USAID outlines how the government agency has been encouraging governments, tech platforms, establishment media outlets, and advertisers to work together to censor huge swaths of the internet. This is this ongoing, quote unquote, battle against disinformation. But what does the U.S., just think to yourself, what does the U.S. empire call disinformation? Guess what? It calls uh Anything that doesn't agree with the U.S. empire is, quote, unquote, disinformation, right? Anything that was questioning Russiagate, which we've seen completely collapse, was disinformation. So for years, as they were furthering this drip, drip, drip bullshit of Russiagate, and I hate Donald Trump, but that doesn't mean Russiagate was true. Uh, as they were furthering that, I was called disinformation every day, right? I was uh, put on put on lists. There were articles written about me and others as the disinform agents of disinformation. I was on the cover of the New York Times arts section as they wrote an article about me and all of my evil disinformation. He questions Russia Gate. What? How could he? Oh, what a terrible little so and so. He's questioning Russiagate. He questions whether the U.S. should create coups around the world. He questions whether the U.S. should drop something like twenty to 40,000 bombs a year. Oh, the worst. Anyway, um, so outlines how the government agency has been encouraging governments, tech platforms, establishment media outlets, and advertisers to work together to censor huge swaths of the Internet. The 97-page disinformation primer purports to be fighting fake news. However, much of the organization's focus appears to be on preventing individuals from finding information online that challenges official narratives and leads to increased questioning of the system more generally. And, you know, there's no, there, there, you can see why outlets such as Mint Press, this is on Mint Press, I worked for them for a year. Um, they do great work. Uh, you can see why outlets like Mint Press have been so thoroughly suppressed, okay? They they uh, cannot get, the, their, their stuff cannot be seen. It, if you share it, it's, uh, you know, it's shown to like a tiny number of people. And of course, I've faced that as well. The document calls for regulating video games and online message boards, steering individuals away from alternative media and back towards more elite friendly sites and for governments to work with advertisers to cripple organizations that refuse to tow official lines financially. Furthermore, it highlights, highlights government-backed fact-checking groups like Bellingcat, Graphica, and Atlantic Council, Council as the leaders 
of fighting disinformation. These assholes are the faces of disinformation. Atlantic Council is a U.S. government group think tank that tries to suppress anything that is anti-U.S. government or anti-U.S. empire. That is their job. Bellingcat is a so-called investigative news outlet that basically just puts out documentation on how uh, Russia tried to poison somebody. But for some odd reason, this elite Russian squad of poisoning goons were told about. There's been whole CBS reports on the elite Russian poisoners. And for some reason, they can just never actually kill anyone. Have you ever noticed that? They just... They just go in and they just poison somebody that's a Russian enemy uh, just enough to make them really sick and unhappy. It's just an unhappy poisoner. And they, uh, you know, the Skripal poisoning, the Navalny poisoning, they just, and I, this is not to say, you know, Navalny wasn't an enemy of the state. He also was a neo-Nazi, but he was an enemy of the U, the Russian state. He was put in prison. He did die in prison. Uh, although even you, even Ukrainian intelligence says he legit died from, was it heart trouble or something? Anyway, so you'd think they'd want to believe that he was assassinated, but they said he wasn't. Anyway, uh, for some odd reason, Russia and all these high, they, they always poison people with a poison that can be, no, that can be carefully discovered and points to Russia and never kills the person. Have you noticed that? Just every time. Every, it's like it's like if they were stabbing someone with a Russian flag to try and assassinate them, but it never really stabbed anywhere important. They just like stab them in the leg with a Russian flag and run off and everybody would be like, I think the Russians did this. Anyway, interesting note about the elite Russian poisoning squad. Uh, but I just wanted to bring you one other thing in this article. Uh, I think a lot of it you're kind of like, yeah, this is how bad it's gotten. Uh, but this is kind of like, it's good to see the the uh, actual proof, the actual receipts. Just wanted to bring you this paragraph. The USAID document also warns that satire can be a major source of misinformation. While this is potentially true, the past decade has seen notable satirists that critique power and the status quo, such as Lee Camp, chased off multiple platforms, suggesting that certain types of satire might pique the ire of censors far more than others. Yeah, I've heard of that guy. He's uh, He's been censored and suppressed a lot, hasn't he? Um, <laughs> but yes, I think they kind of find comedy scary. I know that a lot of what I do on these live streams is not comedy, so there is that fact. But obviously, Redacted Tonight, my bigger TV show, was comedy. And I think that the ruling elite find that kind of scary because it's like, oh, well, they can't just say this person's lying. They... They, they have to say, oh, his comedy is dangerous. Like, that's what the New York Times uh, cover the arts page article said, is basically like, oh, this comedian is kind of dangerous because he's not pushing U.S. propaganda. Anyway, wanted to bring you that important article from Alan McLeod uh, about the ongoing so-called war against disinformation that is not actually disinformation. Hey, Blue Bay, thank you so much for the donation. Yeah, goddamn hero. Yeah, goddamn straight Blue Bay. Says, thank you, Lee, for everything in Chris Hedges' free Palestine. And just a reminder, even if you're not watching this live, I know a few thousand of you watch it live, but tens of thousands of you watch it later, you can still uh, hit the thanks icon and throw a couple of bucks to the show and show some solidarity that way and keep this show uh, actually, actually keep the lights on. And, uh, you know, I, it's not gotten to the point that I could, Oh, I don't know, hire a producer. That'd be nice. Or, uh, or hire an editor. That'd be nice. But, uh, we'll, you know, we'll get there one day, one day we'll, we'll be there. So, all right, moving on. This is, uh, and, and in a few minutes, I'm going to destroy, obliterate. I'm going to tear limb from limb. Tucker Carlson. Can you imagine a more rational world where it was just like, I'm going to moderately critique this person. But no, we don't live in that world. We have to destroy someone. So, um, and thank you, uh, Cod Seas. This is absolutely accurate. Lee needs finances to support his cocaine habit. That is exactly what needs to go down. Uh, no, sadly. 
that's that's not where the money's going. Man, that sounds like a lot. It sounds like you have created you, you have imagined a far more fun uh life for me than uh, than I have going. But okay. Uh I wanted to show how we are now back to the the US propaganda has gotten to such a level that we're now almost back to the axis of evil days. The days when good old George W. Bush would, would walk out of there and go, oh, they're axis of evil. They're causing evil around the world. And we're the good guys and they're the evil. We are just about back to that level of idiocy. Uh, here is, let's see, commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, and. Uh, his name is Admiral Aquilino. Aquilino. And uh, yeah, let's watch him for a minute. I've described the security environment as the most dangerous I've seen is in 40 years in uniform and a big portion of. God, that's so true. The security of this world is the worst it's been in 40 years since that moron's been in uniform. And you want to know why? Because the U.S. is pushing us to the brink of nuclear war every goddamn day. Every day. The U.S. pushes us closer and closer to that brink of nuclear war. Atomic scientists say it's 90 seconds to midnight, and it, it, which midnight obviously is nuclear Armageddon. And the, 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 the U.S. government does it every day. Every day they say, let's see how close we can get. Let's see if we can inch a couple little steps closer. We're, we're so close. Can, can we get nuclear Armageddon? Anyway, so here is this numbskull saying it's the most dangerous we've seen. Yeah, but not for the reasons you're saying, you lunatic. That are the cooperation, number one, between... <laughs> I just like the... Sorry, I, I know I'm interrupting mid-sentence, but I just like the sentence. This is the most dangerous it's ever been in 40 years because of the cooperation. If you, were to, if you were to put a period right there, that is what the U.S. actually believes. They do not want cooperation amongst nations. They want instability and collapse among any nation that is even mildly competitive to the United States or even mildly different from the U.S. model. Like Cuba is not competitive to the United States. It's simply not big enough. It's a tiny little island. And yet the U.S. despises and fights them at every turn simply because they have socialism. It's the, it's the threat of a good idea. It's the threat of the fact that the Americans can look over at Cuba and go, why do they get health care? Why do they get guaranteed employment? Why do they get education? Why do they get to have a, a, an okay life? That's not fair. Why do they get to rate higher on a happiness index, even though uh, we have all the money and they don't? Well, maybe it's because we have a system that's all about uh, extracting from everywhere around the world, but also from extracting about extracting us. Do you understand, folks? It. Yes, the U.S. extracts from everywhere around the world. That is what made the U.S. capitalism very rich and successful. But at the same time, as that's going on, as the tentacles go outward, they also go inward. It is also about the richest people in the United States, call it the top 10%, call it the top 1%, whatever you want to call it, extracting from all of the rest of us. So it is also about that. It is not U.S. It is not the U.S. versus other countries. It is actually the ruling elite of the U.S. versus everyone. And maybe you can throw in the ruling elite of Britain and ruling elite of Canada or something and say that little group. But whatever it is, it is not the U.S. versus these bad guys. It is the richest of the rich against us, against you and me. And they have gotten – nationalism is a parasite. It is a brain disease and they use it to keep you scared and keep you dumbed down and keep you not questioning and keep you accepting, ex accepting of the idea that, you know, I and the few independent media people who actually are speaking the truth, like Chris Hedges, we're the ones that are wrong or to be afraid of. Anyway, thank you so much, Byron Rom, for the donation over on Rumble. Goddamn hero. The PRC and are the cooperation, number one, between the PRC and Russia. Again, in President Xi's words, a relationship that has not been seen in 100 years. And we should listen to him when he speaks. They tell us what, what they're thinking about. A relationship of cooperation that has not been seen since in 100 years. 
Uh, even and the argument of the person who posted this is that that's actually a mistranslation of what he said. That's not actually what he said. So, but even if it were what he said, that China and Russia have cooperation, that's a good thing. Powerful countries cooperating would be a good thing. We should all be cooperating to create a better world rather than the collapsing world we're currently in. We are in gut-wrenching climate crisis, and yet the U.S. is not cooperating with other countries to find a better system. We should evolve beyond this shit show. Blue Panda donated over on Rumble, says, wish it were more. Thanks, Lee. Well, you're the best, Blue Panda. That's all right if you're not able to donate more. Thank you for the solidarity. But let's, uh, let's hear a little more from this lunatic. So that cooperation from those two authoritarian nations puts us in a different security environment. So I'm very concerned about that. It's amplified with regard to the DPRK supporting Russian in the form of uh, ballistic missiles. Yeah, uh, Korea is uh, supporting or cooperating with Russia. Well, maybe if you didn't, uh, you know, try and kill Koreans at every moment, and maybe if you hadn't uh, murdered a quarter of their entire population, maybe they'd feel differently. Eh? Maybe that's a thing that could have happened. Maybe if when Donald Trump, who is a maniac, eh, but he is uh, his own maniac, I'll give him that, uh, he is a lunatic, and he is a belligerent, war-hungry, fr frothing-at-the-mouth lunatic. But in certain areas, he did try and create peace. He also created war in other areas. But in certain areas, he tried to create peace. Every time he was cut off by the military-industrial complex and by Pompeo and by Bolton and by various others, I'm grouping them all together, uh, he was cut off with trying to create peace with Korea, cut off trying to withdraw troops from Syria, cut off trying to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. They stopped him at every turn. Now, he is a lunatic, so I'm not saying, oh, Mr. Peace Nick Donald Trump. In fact, more bombs were dropped under Donald Trump by the Pentagon than were dropped under Obama. So let's not pretend that he was a peaceful dude. But I'm just saying, any president who tries to create peace with one of these quote unquote enemies. Trump also assassinated Iran's top general, nearly creating a goddamn nuclear war. So there's that too. But anytime they try and create peace, they will be stopped. And if you really try and create peace, and if you really try and, and break up the CIA and scatter them to the winds, well, then your head goes pop on live television from multiple angles. Yeah, that's the last time that happened. I wonder why. Maybe it's because we're living currently in coup America. We were cooed with the assassination of JFK by the CIA and others, and we're still living in that absolute psychopathic nation. Missiles and other munitions and capabilities. My sense is this is a way to combat the broadened United States alliances, partnerships with our like-minded allies and partners. This is their counter. But I articulate it. We're almost back to the axis of evil when you plug Again, Iran to this. There it is. We're back to the axis of evil, baby. Yeah. Thank goodness. You know, it's been too long. I hope they bring back the color coded alert chart. I hope they bring that back because I have some orange sweaters. I have not found a reason to wear recently. And it would be really exciting if they could get that color alert chart going again. The terror alert chart. Oh, God, these lunatics. I mean, and the other thing is, like, get a new playbook. You already did the access of evil garbage. It's like, come up with, with a new one. I know we're, they did have a new one a couple of years back. They said the Troika of Tyranny, but it's, you know, that one didn't, it wasn't catchy. It wasn't catchy. Americans can't pronounce Russian words. So, you know, come up with something new, the access of evil. Stop using the same old garbage playbooks. Okay. Uh, enough from that lunatic. Let's move on to destroying Tucker Carlson. Uh, and here's the thing. I actually am going to play a clip where he's uh, kind of talking about something. I really, Oh, I should mention, we're going to go over to rumble.com slash Lee Camp. It's free to watch there, all right? I'm not, I'm not shutting it down for all of you. Don't have a couple of bucks. Rumble.com slash Lee Camp. You can join me over there. And uh, we will, we will do this, do this clip uh, here. I'll even, uh, I'll even put the clip in the chats, chats for you. All right, here it is. 
join me over there. Free to go over there. Hit subscribe when you get there. Or hit follow. I guess it's called follow over there. Hit follow and then uh, hit the bell icon. But yeah, rumble.com slash lead camp. Join me over there. Rumble.com slash lead camp. It's free to watch. Also, if you're on Locals, everything stays the same. Locals is my community where uh, you can support the show. If you think you're getting 38 cents out of this hour,